mission given to me by Woody Shaw, Sunship, Dizzy, and Billy Higgins, dedicated to pursuing a piece of our cultural heritage through interviews with my jazz heroes. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome everybody inside the Blackwood Broadcasting Studios at an undisclosed institute of higher learning. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're happy to have all of you along with us today. There was a time in this country when a younger generation chose to buck the realities of linear life and carve their own paths, legacy paths, if you will. This generation had been inundated with Frank Sinatra and Doris Day, Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry, and were frankly bored to death. What was resonating inside of them was the sounds they were hearing and emulating from the smoky blues players who sung about real life and playing acoustic instruments. Everything was in mono. It's not easy for white folks to comp Blind Lemon Jefferson, Reverend Gary Davis, and Shaky Jake. For it to be an authentic emulation, this generation had to understand the stories and the regional sophistication of these masters. They had to be eclectic and musicologists in their own way, scouring for those obscure LPs at Village Music run by John Goddard. My guest today was part of this generation who set out to learn from these masters and add his own accent. The messages and the stories came through in their own cadence with washtub basses, mandolins, dobros, and pottery pie. Old folkies like Eric Von Schmidt, Dave Van Ronk, and my guest were the precursors to psychedelic electric music. These jug bands were looking to turn back the hands of time, singing about being sleepy or having been all around this world, performing at Folk City or Boston's Club 47 with the likes of Bill Monroe, Tex Logan, and other forefathers of traditional American music. My guest today is a prolific singer, songwriter, and multiple instrumentalist. He plays the guitar, organ, and saxophone, among others, started making albums on prestige folklore and reprise, and played with all the heavies, Butterfield, Bobby Charles, Gene Dinwiddie, the aforementioned Van Rock, Dave Grisman, John Kahn, Fritz Rich, Richmond, and Bill Keith. It's an honor to welcome Jeff Muldauer to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, Jake. How you doing? I like this idea of bucking reality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I... Uh, I think I'm still doing this. You're absolutely... You're doing it, and you've done it, and uh, and that's why I, I, it's, <laughs> it's great to talk to you. But I, I, I have to... Straight from the gate here, I wanted to ask you... Could you talk about your relationship with uh, Ralph Rinsler and how he preserved American folk music? I didn't have much of a relationship with him. I uh, the only relationship is that we were steeped in similar musics. Um, I knew him, and we spent a little time together. But that's it. that's the only thing I can say about Ralph. I mean, he um, he was there a few years before I was, and discovered this other world that I discovered when I was a kid listening to 78s and old LPs and and um, that was the world of this rural America that growing up around New York I knew nothing about um, so it just this stuff all caught me and it caught him he was an, an academic more than anything else I suppose one could say although he picked a little didn't he he did so, um, you know, those guys, he got to wear suits and stuff like that because he worked at the Smithsonian, which I was always jealous of. He was also in charge of uh, the Folkways uh, record label at some point as well. I just, right. I, you know. Well, that, he was the head of the Smithsonian Music when the Folkways came to, you know, be gotten. And he may have even engineered that. I don't know. He did a lot of good stuff. There's no doubt about it. I was going to say because, you know, he was a little bit older than you, but I wanted you to talk about, you know, uh, in your own mind, you know, 
when you first started to hear these sounds of rural America and knowing nothing about it, how did you, um, how did you become, how did it become authentic to you? How did it become real to you that you knew, um, that you weren't, uh, like I said in my intro, it's, it's, it's not easy for, for, for a kid from New York to, uh, to, to pretend that he, uh, you can't pretend. So how did you get, that's did, right. You, you got it. You can't pretend, which is, this is an interesting subject. What is it about me or about Paul Butterfield or about Spider John Kerner or Bobby Charles or something that, you know, can take on uh, a world that's removed from them, a little less so for Bobby, but, and find that it fits. Not that you're, you have to put on a, face for it but that you it fits it fits what's inside your body so when you let your stuff come out it happens to blend nicely it's an it's a complete mystery and it always will be so but it's it it also explains why you know when i picked up guitar to play country blues uh, acoustic guitar we don't think there were more than 75 or 100 people in the united states doing that Wow. You know, and now there's 100,000. Now, out of that 100,000, how many Paul Butterfields are there? I got it right now. I got it down to zero. Yeah, there, it's, it's, it's officially, it might be in the negative range. Actually. Yeah, well, I'm just saying it's an odd, it's a, it, this is why I believe in zeitgeists, you know. Mm -hmm. why I believe in the big spiritual bomb, you know, that went off in Vienna at the, end of the 18th century into the early 19th century and and what happened in our country you know late 1880s maybe to the 60s you know this explosion of geniuses um in all sorts of music you know not just not just blues and jazz but all sorts of stuff you know so some of this has got to remain mysterious and just for the enjoyment of it. Yeah, the thing is that, you know, for me in my body, like I just have started, like, as we were talking before the show, you know, it's to me, this is, has been a great awakening in some ways. And I, I wanted to go after my, the guys that I idolized uh, so much. And some of them have, 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 have passed us guys like Jerry Garcia and John Kahn and people like that. But I said, well, you know, this is, how am I going to possibly, uh, you know, find what I'm looking for? I have to go back and find these guys who actually had opportunities to, um, you heard your heroes on the, on the record player and you were actually able to see them in very intimate settings, very close settings, which made them very real people. You were very close to them. And it yeah, be, and even hung out with them. And got to hang out, and they actually spent time with you. It was, as as opposed to today, when we have almost created, uh, across the board, this idea of this sort of the superhuman. It's not realistic. When as before, you had, you know, you had blind dobro players singing about the blues. They were living it, so it was authentic. That's why there was only... It was authentic, but, but I must tell you... At a young age, one still was blinded by the mythology of everything. I mean, I didn't, as I aged, or as I have aged, um, I, people have taken on a more real uh, manifestation than they did before. Um, you know, when I was hanging out, obviously when I was hanging out, you know, with... Mississippi John Hurt or with Lonnie Johnson or even with Duke Ellington, you know, even met him a couple times, you know. I mean, these these guys were so huge in my mind that I couldn't really see them, you know. So then as you, as they pass away and you're reading books and you're remembering back and you're aging, you're getting some perspective in life, they, they become human beings. And the the thing that remains the mystery is there's no common personality trait that makes someone a great musician or or almost a great anything man it's it's a talent that is given to various organisms <laughs> <laughs> and that's it you you know mm -hmm. um, uh, you know 
Muddy Waters. I saw Muddy Waters check his watch one time on the end of a tune, and he was still singing great. But he was looking at his watch to see what time it was for the night, you know, the set. And I said to myself, this guy's just channeling, man. I mean, how can you sing like that and look at your watch, you know? Um, you know, and, and then you find about the find out about the foibles of, of Duke Ellington and later on and you know, it's not all it's not personality doesn't necessarily hook into all this stuff. It's magic, man. It's, it is magic. It is magic. It's and it's 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 magical to talk to Jeff Moldauer today. Uh, I just wanted to when I was listening to a, an earlier interview you did, and, and I, I gather that your brother's record collection was very helpful to you as well early on in your in, in your. Yeah, I mean, look, he had all these seventy eights, you know, and LPs. He was ten years older than I was, so when he was collecting, at, I mean, and he collected at an early age, so sixteen, eighteen years old. I was six or eight years old, so when he was playing all those Louis Armstrong records and Bessie Smith and. All this one Cindy Mache and it was just incredible. And Big Spider back I was sitting in there listening, you know, and I didn't particularly enjoy the surroundings of my home. And when I heard these sounds, they resonated with me and besides that, um it was a, a way to get out of where I was in my mind, my heart, you know. And it might not have been that way for somebody else, but in my case, that's that's what it was. You know, like what Malcolm X says about the the field slave. You know, when he's asked if he wants to leave the plantation, he says, "Take me with you when you want and when you go, because any place is better than this." You know, mm-hmm. so uh, that's what happened for me. I heard these sounds. People like Vera Hall singing these a cappella things and beautiful sounds of people's voices and weird sounds like lead belly what the hell was that you know and the thing that was going on around my neighborhood eventually was doo-wop and uh, the early r&b stuff i mean my first record i bought was on a 78 of uh at my front door by the eldorados and then the in came 45s <clears throat> so I was really into Fats Domino and things like that. But at the same time, I had been listening to this incredible jazz music. And that's where I started out. That's where I returned to uh, repeatedly, you know, repeatedly. You, uh, you know, I, I was uh, talking to, uh, I had a good conversation with David Grisman a couple months ago, and he, he was talking about, you know, uh he was caught up in 50s pop music, uh, you know, with Chuck Berry and, and Elvis and Little Richard. But then at the end of the decade, uh, Elvis went to the Army and uh, and Little Richard found God. And there was this sort of, he termed it a vapid time in music, that early 60s period. And I, I couldn't help but notice that that's when, you know, your jug band uh, came about. And I just wanted to know... Uh, what you thought, why that was the perfect time for cultivation of the jug band, why that hit so, why it resonated so hard during that, that early 60s period? Well, <clears throat> I guess we needed an audience, and they were just starting to get interested. Um, I don't quite, you know, I mean, what Grisman, Grisman's very articulate, by the way. I like his interviews. Yeah, and we we talk. But, yeah, but you can find only about you know ten thousand uh, uh, wonderful musical things happening in that period that he says went dry a little bit. Um, but he's right about that that lull, and I you know what I can't put my finger on it. What you. Maybe everybody was sick of Ray Kniff singers, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, even when, when people forget when Bob Dylan put out that first album, it didn't sell anywhere near what these horrible, you know, Andy Williams albums and shit sold, man. I mean, it was still bubbling under when we were having our best times. It was still a very substrata thing, which I always like. I like being under radar. Absolutely. No, and, and uh, I want to cue up a tune 
for uh, Jeff Moldauer uh, right now. That's going to take you back in time. I found this at uh, found this buried in a thrift store in Alston, Massachusetts, for two dollars. So let's take a listen to this, and we'll come back and talk about it. Mm-hmm. Trouble in mind, I'm blue But I won't be blue all the way Just cause the sun's gonna shine In my back door someday I'm going down to the river I'm gonna take my rocking chair If the blues don't get me I'm gonna rock on away from here I'm gonna Sleepy Man Blues on Prestige Folklore, 1963, Trouble in Mind. And uh, my engineer runs a program called The Morning Brew on KXCI, which is a local station here in Tucson. He played the title track, Sleepy Man Blues. So that was out in Tucson this morning, early in the morning. Just wanted to let you know that. (laughs) Tucson. You know, it's a it's a it's an eclectic place, and uh, and uh, but we're, we Jeff Moldauer was out in the in in the and it was uh, probably thirty something degrees, forty one degrees. Er, it's cold down here. And, uh, hey, I had my first puff of a joint in Sabino Canyon. Get out of here! <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, you know, and that's the other thing that Grisman talked about was that you know everyone was smoking dope. Even Earl Scruggs ate one of Bill Keith's brownies. And that's the thing. <laughs> Did he mean to? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. The, when I was listening to that, I'm I'm not thrilled by that. I, 
it reminded me of a, a, another mystery. Okay. And that is, I think I've, uh, that was a very early attempt to find my voice, find how to do things. And it took me a while. Uh, some people, it doesn't take but a minute. And two that come to mind are Bob Dylan and Maria Muldoor. She was right out of the blocks. She was her best, you know. And I feel that way about Dylan. His singing, his phrasing, his his mind. Some people and Butterfield. I have a I have a tape of Butterfield playing. I think in '64 in a friend of mine's kitchen. He was perfect. He was already perfect. So some people seem to get it early, and some people seem to. I don't know. Learn as they go. I guess. I'm, I'm I mean, I, I in don't. About two weeks, I'm about to peak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're you're a late bloomer. So am I. I keep telling my kids that. You know, you just wait. The best is yet to come. No, the thing is that. Uh, but I don't think that if you were out of your league, I don't think uh, you know prestige would have come calling in 1963 to to have you put together this album. Albeit, you know, this is just my opinion. This isn't uh, no, and I like Bob but I, Weinstock's opinion. This is my opinion. Yeah. No, but I also tend to think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but there were cats like Rick Danko and Bobby Charles, Levon Helm, yourself. You didn't accept mediocrity. And I think that's what was shining through right now. I mean, you can give credit to other people. They might be as... You were hard on yourselves because you wanted to get better. Well, of course. Quoting Robert Shelton here from the New York Times, uh... His plaintive, vibrato-laden voice is an exciting vehicle for country blues. Hmm. So, you know, it, but when you think about, like, what was the, can you, as, it was a long time ago, granted, but what was that, stu- there were no walls up in the studio. I mean, it, it, I, I, when I think of prestige, I think of soul jazz, Van Gelder Studios. Well, I wish I had recorded in Van Gelder Studio. Right. And so talk of this prestige folklore. I found this thing for $2, green label pressing of Sleepy Man Blues. And I said, boy, Jeff Muldaur, this is interesting stuff. I didn't know he, he put out his own stuff. You know, and, and uh, so what was, what was that session like? Are these guys, Had you known these guys? Uh, yeah, for I play- didn't know the piano player. I knew the people in the room, and we were, we were just friends then they pretty much knew how to play what I wanted. And at the time, I wasn't, I hadn't gone into my sort of jazz brain yet and started to, as we say, molderize my material. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but let me, yeah, that's, yeah, don't. <laughs> Which has happened later. This was just simple, strum the thing, enjoy yourself, relax, have fun with these wonderful songs of these great, artist did before you. I realized listening to that, I was more influenced by Lonnie Johnson singing than I thought. Right. And that seemed to sort of go away a little bit after maybe I got with Butterfield. Um, and, um, you know, that's how it started out. I can't stop that album. I've signed so many of those albums, I swear to God, I I should be rich from how many they sold. You have no <laughs> idea, you, you know, as I you... I didn't uh, sell any, but I, I probably signed, you know, thousands of them, so... Well, you should talk to some of the old uh, black jazzers who uh, who never even saw copies of the albums they were on, never even got a cut of the money, and they sell for 50, 60 bucks on... You yeah, know, yeah. You know, it's... But, you know, I think that, that in essence... Uh, I mean, how was it that you would that you would choose a lot of these songs? A lot of these are are ri- not your original songs. Uh, you know, you have Ab- right. Ab- Aberdeen, Mississippi blues, and well, these are just things that you know we were still in the falling in love stage. So you know, as soon as I heard Book of White, I went berserk, and you know Lonnie Johnson and these people, and so you pretty much just wanted to do their tunes. I I've been sticking with Jelly Roll Baker, the first tune on the album, because I think it's pretty funny to do it. Today, I do it with Jim Queskin when we play. Um, but generally, this was just, gosh, I can do this too, kind of album. <laughs> right. You know, there was no great contribution on this album. Um, I don't think I've made great contributions, but I've made little ones. And uh, didn't, didn't I don't think I made any on that. I think what's appealing, that I, I still cringe a little, but the singing is pretty unique to, um 
and has been my whole life. I don't know why I get to sing like that, but uh, and I did, it's it's interesting. I didn't realize how much Lonnie Johnson was in my makeup by then. He just I'll tell you what it is about certain singers, and what I think a lot of people miss, especially with the blues, is that they the ones I love enunciate. Now maybe not on that album. Some of those guys you couldn't even understand what the hell they were saying. But later on, as I got into Sippy Wallace, and then I thought about Lonnie Johnson again, and and even people like Don Redman from the McKinney's Cotton Pickers, they actually spoke. They they spoke at you, so you would listen <laughs> to right. the words, mm-hmm. you know. And um, these things came, like I said, these things came to me slowly. I'm just just picking up on some of it right now. We're we're uh, we're in the uh, midst of an evolution here with with Jeff Moldauer uh, on the Jake Feinberg show. I, I, you know, you talked about the substrata being below the baseline, being below. Uh, you know, Dylan, uh, his first album was not uh, really highly received, and people were still buying the pop stuff. But you know, as a journalist, I wanted to ask you about the you know the other reason I'm even connected to this stuff because I was born in you know 1978. And uh, the only reason I can actually latch on to this stuff is because of guys like, uh, you know, uh, Walt Crane, who wrote these notes. And I wanted to ask you about one guy who was, you know, at Folk City quite a bit. He was writing a lot of liner notes. I've interviewed him a couple times. And uh, how pivotal were guys like Nat Hentoff to getting this stuff disseminated in its own way uh, to get it, get this stuff out there and write about it, articulate what you guys were trying to do? I'd say Nat Hentoff uh, was extremely influential because um, he actually knew what he was talking about. <laughs> he wrote well. He did uh, write well. Yeah. Um, and a few others were misleading, and over the years, their, um, you know, especially their history and stuff has been corrected and things like that. So you, ha- you have these uh, histories tough, as you know. It uh, uh, people get it wrong, and that becomes the the legend forever. You know, if they get in there first. So, I think Nat Hentoff is a really good example of a very important and sort of an integral part of the the getting out this obscure stuff. You know, obscure is obscure when when this all started to happen. So bless him. He's great. You know, there was a guy at the New York Times who wrote these things, and um, he didn't know he didn't know nothing. He used to call, he used to call Van Rock just to ask, because you know, what do I write now? Right. <laughs> so there were you know a wide range of people, but Antoff was a good one. You know, the other thing that caught my ear uh, the other uh, when I was listening back to this other interview is this idea that you said. Um, that in many ways the Queskin uh, Jug Band was a precursor for uh, like the Grateful Dead, mm-hmm. and I wanted you to to talk to my audience about if you could extrapolate on that. I, I find that to be a, a very interesting statement, and I definitely uh, don't know. So I'm asking you to to articulate that. Well, this is one of the only true things I've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, first of all, as part of the historical record, you know. Jerry didn't have a band until he heard the Jim Quest and Jug Band album. When that kid ran came into his store, and who was the other guy in the band with him? I forgot his name. Um, and played him the record, and they said, let's form a jug band. So they formed a jug band. And, you know, they picked up quickly on the on the fact of plugging things in, which we never did for, for a long time until the very end we were... Bill Keith had a pedal steel. But what people don't understand about the jug band, I mean, you know, the music's interesting and fun, and we had a lot of energy, and you couldn't compare us to anything, so that made life real easy in terms of festivals and TV shows and all that. We really had fun. But before we came along, people were dressed in striped, short sleeve shirts and the, the the lack of authenticity about the presentation of music was pretty shocking mm-hmm. as to what people thought was folk music like 
hang down your head Tom Dooley, the Kingston Trio and things like that. And the jug band shows up on stage with their street clothes and no routine. It was shocking to everybody. Um, we played a gig out in L.A. in 1963 or four. I, I can't quite remember which, but our first gig in L.A., L.A. was so unhip at that time that it was really a difficult week. We used to play a week at a time or two weeks at a time. We played at the Troubadour, and a guy came up to the dressing room in between sets, and he said to us, you know, I kind of like you guys. And he said, I like the no shtick shtick. Mm -hmm. In other words, they never heard anything like that before, and they never seen anything like that. And what what was interesting about L.A. was people like Buddy Epson came to see us because they were thinking of us for the, you know, Beverly Hillbillies, or Strike Jones came to hear us and things like that, because they wanted to see what the latest act was. And they were disappointed because we weren't an act. <laughs> It was ref but that, that's the most refreshing. That, that's beautiful, though. Well, the, to us it was. You know, we knew we were just different. And, uh, and, and definitely this was a precursor of what the attitude of the Grateful Dead was. It's just they plugged in. You know, the jug band never plugged in. I probably wouldn't be alive today if we had. <laughs> You're right. Because it, it upped the, it upped the, uh, the audience immensely. So uh, I'm glad that never happened to us, but uh, not that I didn't enjoy playing electrically with Butterfield. Well, I'm curious that when you went out to, uh, did you uh, is that when is that when you had a chance to meet Richard Green? Uh, I know he was. I don't know how Richard got in the group, but when I heard about him being in it, I wanted I was the guy who got him in it because I wanted to write arrangements, right? And I knew he could do that play it with me and I'd play the clarinet he'd play two parts on the fiddle and things like that so that for me was a very interesting time in terms of arrangements he, he talked to me about uh, LA at that time being actually a hotbed or when he was out there you know absorbing Scotty Stoneman and, and doing the, he, he said that uh, you know Los Angeles was a hotbed of bluegrass activity at that time in 63 no, see, we didn't get to Richard until 66 or 7. You got to him in 6. And a lot happened fast. Oh, man. He was late in the group. Things happened fast. By the time we were coming back to do the Steve Allen shows and the, and, uh, you know, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and things like that, we were playing at, at the Ash Grove, and for some reason all these hipsters were sitting in front of us. It, it just happened fast. Things happen fast amongst the young. Well, I was going to ask, you know, you, you seem to strike me, without ever having personally met you, you know, somebody who's <clears throat> dedicated themselves to the uh, keeping uh, not just traditional music intact, inta but also, like, history, like we talked about. And history mm -hmm. is not always, uh, if, if people get in there and they're the first ones to, uh, to lay down the facts, if they're the wrong facts, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, there's something about, uh, you know, just even looking at the, um, you know, I, I guess my question is prior to you guys, uh, these stage acts, uh, needing to, you know, dress a certain way and look mm -hmm. a certain way. And even they, they were, they brought you out to LA to, to sort of see if you were going to be this, what could they, what could they shape you as, you know, why? It was. It was. It was. It always. About, it was even about money in the forties and fifties. It, it was. It was that the reason it was about uh, not what you played, but but what you looked like. It was everything but the music. Well, one of the things that made the Cambridge folk scene so special and so pure, I think, unfortunately, had to do with the sort of upper middle class, educated uh, group that got involved in this. In other words, I don't think there was the drive. There were certain people who had a drive to make make it quotes, but mostly we were. It arrived out of a, our music came out of a social setting. You know, I was very reluctant to even 
you know, we didn't go to New York to to get a record deal or anything. They came to us. They come up there and see the band, you know. So we were very anti-business. At least I was and quite a few others were. Not that we wouldn't do it, but it just wasn't the motivator. The motivator was to find that jewel somewhere inside of you, you know, with other people and to make it a really, you know, valuable experience. Now, when you went down to New York, man, those people were thinking about making it. Right. <laughs> New York's always been that, ever since the Dutch started the place. So it was shocking to me. I think Kreskin was more suited to business, and that's why he was the leader of the band. But to me, I just I was just having fun, you know. So right. that, you- that's the kind of thing, and I think the Jerry thing is, fits right in with all that. You know, just, hey, this is a party. You know, yeah, we'll take the money, but it's a party. So it was when, because you know, I'm sort of fixated on this, uh, the electric, uh, you know, the long uh, improvisational Grateful Dead uh, songs. But you're you're referring more to the early incarnations of of the, yeah. the, the Warlocks type stuff. Well, I know. Yeah. Also, the attitude of not having a shtick, right? Of not having an act of not dressing for the act. Um, and we eventually did. We eventually put on psychedelic clothes a little bit and all that. But just in the be- you know the first few years, it was just like, hello, are you here? Oh, it's an audience. Hi, everybody. People just loved it. it they just loved it. We just, you know, we, we played for 20,000 people at Newport, and it wouldn't matter if we were following Aretha Franklin. You know, it sounds braggy, but it's not, it's absolutely true. We were so different than anything else. It didn't matter what we came before or followed in a festival setting. It was just too fucking crazy. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And and there was a lot of momentum where, I mean, you know, even uh, again, uh, you know, with the, uh, what was the term you used? Molderization? Uh, the, uh, well, that, that's more my own little journey. Right, but I mean, what I'm saying is, you know, it, it, the, these albums on reprise, which are just incredible, the ones that you did with Maria, mm-hmm. that first one, Pottery Pie, which I still need to get my hands on. There th- there you guys are, I mean, sitting, no, talk about no shtick, sitting in a bed with periodicals and newspapers strewn everywhere, Carl Ustremski banner in the background, which is classic. Okay. Love that picture. Oh, I mean, what I'm saying is, I looked at that. And I said, by the way, Maria set the style for women. That look didn't exist before her. When she was on the cover of Rolling Stone with that curly hair, that was it. Fritz used to call it frigate rigging. <laughs> but it became the look. That was the look of the 70s. I mean, you know, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing how many of these early, just simple things, and Fritz's little glasses that he used to make, and it, you know, all of a sudden this Love and Spoonful are wearing them, and the birds, and John Lennon's wearing them, and it became the look, you know. But it was just the personal thing of Fritz's. I'm looking up in Amazon right now, see if I can find you a pottery pie. Good luck. Hey, listen, while you're while you're cruising cruising the bird, <laughs> while you're cruising the bird, uh, we're gonna put on a track here. We both, my engineer and I, really love it a lot. Um, and uh, from your days with uh, Maria, let's uh, let's listen to it, and we'll come back and talk about it. All right.
I'm rich. Yeah. So how how do you how do you when you hear that how how does your d- does it make you cringe or do you feel good about your voice? No, that's 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 heavy. Yeah, that's. I'm he- starting to I'm starting to get it. You're starting to loosen up. I'm starting to get it, and also there's some there's some interesting things about that arrangement. I'm starting to stretch a little. <laughs> so talk about talk about in your talk about it as a musician. What what's interesting about the arrangement and there's. Well, I don't think there were many tunes being put out on Warner Brothers that year in six four. Mm-hmm. Just the just the meter of the thing. <clears throat> Plus, there's a there's a lick on the end that uh, you mentioned Gene Dinwiddie, and uh, he and the other sax player. I remember they were having trouble figuring out how to play it, even though I wrote it out. And um, because it's a pretty offbeat thing that that ending these little ba 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 I guess diddle 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 and um 
And that other sax player went on to play with Stevie Wonder. Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence. He, he was a producer. Um, he ended up producing an album of mine, which it was, it was just it was not very good at all. <laughs> no, but, but, um, you, yeah, go ahead. But in any case, I... I've always felt that he got something from that session and added a little something. I've heard things in some of those arrangements later with Stevie, the horn arrangements, that I thought maybe I'd given him a little hint of the future on that that arrangement. That's just a little uh, projecting my own grandiosity, but um, I always thought that that was a sort of an eye opener to him. That session on "I'm Rich," it it was stretching it, man. I'd, I'd like to I'd like to record that again. With you know, I get some other ideas. Oh, I, I mean, this is <laughs> I I think the best one of the best points you made is that <clears throat> on uh, Warner Brothers. You just this is such a uh, this is an album all the way through. You would not. Uh, in, in 1972, it's just it's just totally unique, and it and and uh, I, I found it at a record shop, a record show, a couple couple weeks ago for like six bucks. Mm-hmm. So now it's just a matter, of, you know. Uh, they're, they're, hey, you can. I just looked up Pottery Pie. You can get that, man. You can get that yeah, for a mere fifty five dollars. Japanese import LP. No, you can get the the LPs too, but. I want, I want an LP, and I'm gonna I'm gonna come find. I'm gonna have you sign oh, it for me. You'll find it. It's go on there. Yastrzemski. Yastrzemski. No, no. I I you know this is really important. One of the things that I just fantasize about. I didn't realize this, but this was recorded in Bearsville as well, you know, in upstate New York. And uh, what was the what was the pact? I don't know if that's the right word, but it was like you, you know what was the pact between. All the, the the guys living up there, Butterfield, yourself, Maria, Dylan, Danko. Uh, I mean, it was about it was about making real music. Was it is it that simple to say that or, or no? Go ahead. Once again, there were there were elements in that town which I wasn't used to because I came out of this. Hey, we're not in it for the money. We're just trying to make art thing and. I was, I became, uh, when I got to Woodstock, I started to realize that other people were maybe thinking of showbiz here, you know. So, once again, as I said in the beginning of this interview, that didn't have anything to do with their ability. In other words, you could be totally a showbiz type person and still just be dead on as an artist, you know. But I, the tune "I'm Rich" was a reaction to this, mm-hmm. and everybody was into their cars, and everybody was into the building their new wing on their new thing for the new this and the new that, and um, it, uh, I, you know, to me, I just, you know, I've always been this way. I'm sort of a snob that way. <laughs> well, I mean, I just, I just didn't take to that, but it didn't mean that there weren't some people kicking butt making music i mean come on rick rick danko and those guys were great and butterfield you know so the guy i gravitated to was butterfield we just we hung well together and that's why i ended up being in that band with him called better days yeah no i was gonna say the the you talk about uh you know just sort of the uh the jeff Muldauer. um mindset uh at the you got the you got the the, the pin on that i'm going to need from you as well back to mono on your yeah. on, on your shirt and then you and maria have this sort of looks like some sort of uh you know uh communal garden going on in the background it wasn't about building wings of a house i just you know it is i i talked to my friends today in their early 30s late you know very good musicians craving authenticity and we're just like Whoa, wow, how how hip was it that we you know, we could go to this coffee shop and you know, there's Danko riding his motorcycle and Moldauer's playing, you know, music and Butterfield's, you know, drink you know, there's just this sort of urban it's an it's a it's a the rural legend. But I also tend to think that if, if you actually moved up there, you must have been some of the, the visual images of upstate New York are very powerful and it must have helped in your in your in your writing and your and your music. It might have, it might have. I was breathing some good air up there. <laughs> Definitely, and but, uh, yeah, it was a lot of, you know. But there wasn't as much of a social scene 
Cambridge was happened in people's living rooms. I mean, that's where we we were always picking music, and that was not the case in Woodstock. You know, now I had a studio that I built by myself and with some friends, and and that became a party center. And Happy Tram had parties, but very few people had sort of gatherings the way we did up in Cambridge. I think we had it right. They do that now in uh, in Berkeley. They still do it. People get together and they pick. Now I don't know what that's going to produce or has produced. You know, Grisman Grisman picks in those parties. You know, uh, you know I've seen parties eleven, twelve people picking. You know, four fiddlers, five fiddlers. They all know these old great tunes from Kentucky and all this stuff. It's a beautiful scene, man. It has nothing to do with uh, with you know recorded music and this and that. But I, I love it. I always love that. Um, I both fit in in that situation and don't fit in in that it's not really how my mind works. It's sort of like being on vacation. <laughs> it's really interesting to hear you talk about this. It's it's because I, I came in just assuming that there would be some sort of linear thing, and and uh, and I, when I go back and listen to this, it's just it again it opens my mind to all these these uh the realities of it i was you know i'm going to be up in uh, lexington uh mass uh i was just curious if there's uh i mean i I go to cambridge all the time but is there any uh is there anything resembling uh like you said in berkeley is there anything going on in cambridge now no not that i know of i mean there might be young people getting together and picking but i don't know about it and mo and all the folks that i knew have moved out the thing that it, I, that really it didn't stay whereas those berkeley hills are still you know, they got people who were there years ago. The Thompsons are sort of the center of it. Eric and Susie. You know, you you are very uh, uh, humble about this, but but uh, one thing that is just astounding to me is that whether it's Amos Amos Garrett playing the the trombone or you playing organ or you know you played alto on this album, clarinet, vocals, piano, and guitar. I mean, it seemed to me that. Uh, it, there was a lot of dexterity among the musicians as well. You could have a lot of flexibility and you have a lot of fun mm -hmm. in making these, it, like uh, this other track, Havana Moon. Uh, uh, you know, well, let's just listen to it because I, I need you to come back and, and define a couple of things for me, all right? And then I'm out of here. All right. We, we've been going at it. Okay, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Havana Moon Havana Moon Be all alone with jug around You stand and wait for boat to come It's long and night is quite the dark The boat she laid since twelve o'clock He watched the tide and in is lowly moon, but high the wind, Havana moon, Havana moon. Be all alone, be open and wrong, it's long time waiting for the boat to come. Sail away across the sea. We'll dock in New York. The building's high. We'll find a home up on in the sky. Havana Moon. Havana Moon. We're still alone. We're sipping on. Touch my lips, my eyes close, my heart flips. Havana Moon, Havana Moon. 
tell my audience what a Lujan is? <laughs> I was just thinking about that. I was telling my producer in Amsterdam about that. <laughs> I, it, was a bu- it was a bunch of... Uh, it was a... No, I can't. No, uh, it was <laughs> a, a box that was segmented in, um, you know, sort of like a marimba type of thing, but it was a, it was a plywood box, and it had these uh, metal things just screwed in that to the right pitch, and it was sort of a funkier, sort of in between a marimba and a, and a steel drum kind of sound. We we got it down at Carol Instrument Rental. I think Albert let me go down there and just sort of shop and you know get toys out of the the big store down there. We got a great gong for the Dardanella thing. And um, it was a, look, it was a time when we got to play in the candy store. Warner Brothers was dishing it out. You know, they bought me a house down there. <laughs> I said, well, if I move to Woodstock, I'll need a house. Okay. They So so the reality is you were looking for that Cuban sort of uh, Caribbean mid, uh, steel. Well, drink. when I heard it, I heard it with the track. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was an overdub. So the track was already laid down, and I heard that, and I went, that works. You know, I, I don't conceptualize, I don't go down there saying, you know, we need a marimba for this, because <laughs> Caribbean, but I went, probably went around with Billy Monday, my drummer, and mm-hmm. we started hitting things. And I went, ooh, Havana Moon, listen to this. Havana Moon. Hey, uh, one final question. I know you got to go. I uh, mm-hmm. I would be remiss uh, one of the guys who is, uh, you know, he's in my soul, uh, and uh, I wanted to just get your uh, free association thoughts on uh, a bass player, John Kahn. Well, I was very, very connected to John. We we hit it off real good. He ended up being Maria's boyfriend for a long time. And um, It was funny, because I was listening back to an interview with, with him and Garcia, upstate New York, 78, and Je- I guess this was around the time when he first got together with her. And Jerry talked to the DJ, and he looked over at John. I mean, I just heard this on the radio. He said, "Can I? Can I? Is it okay if I say this?" And he's like, "Yeah, you know, Maria's with John now." So I guess I don't know when that happened, but I was like looking at this. I'm like, I don't quite know when it happened either. To tell you the truth, <laughs> <laughs> I was busy myself. I mean, that's one of the things you did in Woodstock, you know. Right. You, right. Ch- you changed wives. Right. You 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 chase tail. You change partners. So anyway, that's what that went on. But John was a really sensitive, sweet guy. He got too wrapped up in the drugs, as as happens, and that's how he left us. And, um, and you know, he and Merle Saunders came to sort of try out for better days. And I don't know that they would have been right for it. I think Merle would have been right. But I don't know that John would have been. We ended up with with Ronnie Barron and and um, Bill Rich, and Bill Rich was a pretty historic bass player. I think John had a wider range of of knowledge. He was into bar talk while I was into Stravinsky. <laughs> wow! See, this is this is the inside bass. This is classic stuff. You know, I mean that yeah. that's unbelievable. And I used to stay with him, and um, I think when I was staying with him a couple of times. I think he was already dating Maria, but he didn't tell me. He's jerk. such a, we- you know, what a weasel that guy. You know, he, he, <laughs> what I, what, it, you know, uh, he, he was really uh, such a sophisticated guy. But yeah, the, the, the demon, uh, the drugs yeah. really, really caught up with him. And, and that, uh, yeah, yeah, he got stupid. Well, we, but he, he was a good, and he played with, with Jerry and the, that band. I used to sit in, in over at this club in Berkeley with Jerry. And they play, you know, with Merle and everybody. And I used to sing a couple of tunes, and then Jerry would slip me like fifty bucks a tune, <laughs> you know, yeah. out of his pocket. Boom! Hey, man, thanks a lot. Boom! And uh, I'd have to watch, you know, if you were drinking a beer, you'd have to open it yourself, or somebody might have 
you know, put acid right, in drop it. a little liquid in there. You never knew. That's right. Well, so that was a scene. I, I didn't like Hell's Angels guys tongue kissing. Man, that was like forget it. Uh, forget that scene. <laughs> you know, I just want to tell you, it's just for someone like myself who who. Well, it's just so hard. To, it's just wonderful to hear these stories because I can't even. It doesn't make it. It doesn't seem real. But like you said, it, there is a magical component to it. And I'm going to have to go back to the Vienna thing you were talking about earlier and look do some research on that. Well, but, just take it from, uh, you know, Haydn to Schubert. You got it. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert. Give me a break. I mean, maybe you're not into them yet, but you will be. I got to get pottery pie first. But no, <laughs> Jeff, listen, li- listen, happy holidays. And, and uh, you know, I'd like to at some point in the future uh, do maybe another part two because we haven't gotten – we. We, we had a lot of more music no, tracked up. No, no. Um, hopefully I'm in mid-career right now. Right, right. No, as you continue to uh, to cultivate, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch. All right. All right, That's my smart, man. Jake. All right, this yeah, is the Jake right. Feinberg Show. Happy holidays to you and yours, and we'll see you in the new year.